Welcome back. In this next section, I'm going to walk you through how we value assets specifically using two different methods, the replacement cost method and the dividend discount method. So I'll start off with the replacement cost method. And I'll show you how we use it for financial services firms. Then I'll walk you through the dividend discount method or model. Uh, a lot of the time we call this the Gordon Growth Model, so I tend to use that interchangeably, DDM versus Gordon Growth Model. You should just know that those two are one and the same. And then we'll talk about all the issues with the Gordon Growth Model, aka dividend discount model. All right, so let's talk about the first method, the replacement cost method. So this is actually pretty straightforward on the surface. We just take the replacement cost of all the assets, so really the market value of the assets, minus the market value of the liabilities. So what we're left with is the value of this firm, so the intrinsic value. So all we need to do to get a share price of this firm is just divide by number of shares outstanding. Now, this replacement cost method is, it seems really, really simple, but it's really not because you have to value all of the assets at their, what you could get for them. So if you've got, let's say, a thousand different assets, usually, you know, you may be able to get away with, like, valuing those assets by group, but, you know, there's the potential you may have to individually value each asset, which can be very time-consuming. There's a lot of other issues with this method, and the biggest one is probably this one right here. Uh, it's, it's really only appropriate if your firm has no intangibles. If the firm has intangibles, then, you know, maybe there's some intangible value that the firm maybe can't sell, uh, but it's not going to show up in the replacement cost of the assets. So what you're left with is a firm that, you know, it might be a bank, it might be a fruit stand. Uh, a lot of the firms that get valued using this method are going to be financial institutions, say like, uh, oh, oh, just a brokerage firm or your know, traditional commercial bank, something like that. Uh, if you've got a firm that does have a lot of intangible assets, say like Apple, where they have a lot of trademarks and uh, patents, this is not going to be the method that you would want to use for that. Okay, the next method, and the one we'll spend the majority of the time in this video on, the dividend discount model, or DDM, sometimes called the Gordon Growth Model. So this one's pretty straightforward. Uh, I'd say, you know, you've almost certainly seen it in a previous class. Basically, all we're doing is forecasting future dividends, say dividend next year, dividend two years from now, dividend three years from now, et cetera, et cetera. And we're discounting all those dividends back to the present at some discount rate or required rate of return, R. Uh, we call this discount rate the required rate of return because this is the return that investors require. Otherwise, they're going to sell their shares and go elsewhere. So the dividend discount model essentially says that this firm, its price should be equal to the intrinsic value. Uh, it, it should be equal to the, you know, the, the discounted value of all the future dividends. Now, we have a couple of different ways to use this model. Uh, I usually break it down like this. Uh, it all depends on the growth rates of the dividends. So if you have zero growth in the dividends, we say you have a zero growth model. Uh, it's just a perpetuity. Uh, the one you probably saw in Finance 300, especially if you had me, is the constant growth model. So that's just our, you know, very straightforward Gordon growth model. And then also we have the variable growth model, which can take many, many different forms. So let's go through each of these. So our zero growth model, very basic. We assume that the dividend is just not going to change ever. And to value that asset, say a stock, we just divide the dividend by the discount rate or required rate of return. This is often going to be called our perpetuity formula uh, because, you know, this is how we value a perpetuity. So let's take a look at a very basic example. Well, we know GE just issued a total of $1.10 in dividends per share last year, uh, or just now. Uh, the firm also announced it will never adjust the dividend. The firm's required return is 11.4%. What is the intrinsic price per share of GE stock? Well, all we do is just take the annual dividend of $1.10, divide by 11.4%, and I'm getting $9.65. That would be the intrinsic value. Okay, the next model is the uh, constant growth model. So this is essentially our Gordon growth model. 
we just assume that the dividends grow at a constant rate forever, which is obviously not realistic, but hey, it's, it's a simplification model. Uh, so it's just the dividend most recently paid, D0, times 1 plus our dividend growth rate, all divided by our discount rate minus our growth rate. So a uh, couple things here. Yeah, so our discount rate in this model, it's always going to be calculated using the cap M. And in valuation work, we often call this discount rate the required rate of return, or sometimes you'll hear it called the market cap rate, market capitalization rate. Uh, this thing has so many terms. I feel bad for you guys because I want you to know them all, but there's like a half dozen terms for what this is. Uh, market cap rate, required rate of return. Uh, in many contexts, it's the discount rate, uh, the cost of equity. It's all the same thing. So let's take a look at an example. So Peter is considering the purchase of a common stock. The current annual dividend is three euros and 50 cents. Uh, the dividend is expected to grow at a rate of 5% annually. If the required return is 7%, the intrinsic value of the stock is closest to, well, we have some choices. Uh, so let's identify our components here. We know the dividend, or at least the most recent dividend. That's going to be our D0. Our growth rate is going to be 5%, and we know our required return, R, is 7%. So ultimately, we just plug that in. 350 times 1 plus our 5% growth rate divided by 0 0.07 minus 0 0.05, and I'm getting about 184 euros. So answer choice A. All right, so now we have a couple of additional factors to consider. First off, let's start off by talking about what will increase the value of a stock when we use this DDM. Well, the higher the dividends per share, the higher the intrinsic share price or the intrinsic value. Uh, we should also expect that if there's a high growth rate in dividends, that's going to increase our intrinsic value. And then also a low rate of return, a low required return, R, is going to increase our uh, intrinsic value. So the reason for this is that if we have a very small number for R, this is going to make our entire denominator smaller, which makes the entire component on the right-hand side bigger. Now, there are some other issues, and there's a lot of issues with this DDM. It's, it's why I say it's probably the most inaccurate model we have. Uh, basically, we, this thing breaks down for many, many different reasons. So let's talk about them. First off, there's the possibility that the firm's dividends are not going to grow at some constant rate forever. I mean, quite frankly... No company that exists has ever grown at a constant rate forever, or at least grown its dividends at a constant rate forever. So this is automatically you know, something that is just not true in the real world. Another issue with the DDM is that sometimes if you have, a, let's say, a tech firm, your growth rate could be greater than your discount rate, which would make this entire denominator negative because you have like, oh, I don't know, 0 0.08 minus 0.12. So this entire thing's negative, makes the entire tr intrinsic value negative. Uh, obviously, the, the model is broken down. Uh, so that's two big reasons. The third big reason, hey, a lot of dip firms don't pay dividends. So we don't have a D0 here, or rather, our D00, which makes our intrinsic value zero. So there's a lot of ways that this model breaks down. The kindest thing that I can say about this model is that we want to use it as a backup or in conjunction with other valuation models. Okay, one more CFA question. In what phase of its life cycle will it be the most appropriate to value a company using the Gordon growth model? A, the growth uh, time period, B, the mature period of the, of the life cycle, or C, the decline period? Well, the answer here is going to be B. Why? Because in the mature period of the life cycle, we could generally assume that the firm's dividends are going to grow at a fairly low, constant rate. Uh, the growth period, that's not going to be true. The firm's dividends or cash flows, they may grow by like 5% this year, 10% next year, negative 2% the following year. Uh, much more volatile in this growth period. And then in the decline period, uh, you know, you're going to have, well, declining dividends, but sometimes when a firm's in this stage, they might actually just cut the dividend altogether. 
So, you know, really the only possible choice here is B. Okay, so one obvious question is, how do we actually estimate a couple of these components? The dividend, that's easy to identify. The discount rate or, you know, required return, we just use the cap M for that. But how do we get G? Well, G is calculated using one of three methods. We can often try to use the historical behavior of the firm's dividends. So look at how those dividends have grown in the past couple of years. Maybe take like a five-year average or a three-year average or something. Uh, that's one possibility. Another possibility that I am a big advocate for is use our expectations of future dividend growth rates. So if I've got a firm that's operating in the U.S., and I think the firm's pretty mature, I might expect that the firm is only going to grow at about a 2% rate. That would make me want to plug in 2% as my G. Now, a third method out there is this one right here. Multiply the firm's return on equity by the firm's retention ratio, or 1 minus its payout ratio. So what does this look like? Well, we just take the firm's ROE and then multiply that by you know, this 1 minus the, per, the amount of dividends per share divided by earnings per share. And this amount, this B, this is sometimes what we call the plowback ratio, the retention ratio. Uh, quite frankly, this is about the only time you'll ever hear about this ratio. And I'll be blunt, this is kind of inaccurate. So let's say we have a IBM. Their dividend payout ratio is 97.28%, and the firm's ROE is 28.82%. What is the firm's expected dividend growth rate? Well, in this case, we have a fairly high payout ratio, and only about 2.072% of the firm's earnings per share are getting paid out, are, are not being paid out, and that you know, 2.72% can be plowed back into the firm. Uh, the firm's ROE is 28.82%, so we just multiply that 28.82 by, you know, the 1 minus this 97.28%, and I'm getting a an expected dividend growth rate using this model of about, oh, 78 bips, 0.78%. Uh, okay, so let's try another example. You're trying to value Sony, and you know the firm's beta is 1.5. You know the risk-free rate is 1.5% and the market risk premium will be 6%. Sony's ROE is 14% and the firm's dividend payout ratio is 80%. The current dividend per share is $3.50. Use the DDM to calculate the intrinsic value. All right, so let's start off with the required return. Now, our required return or cost of equity, we'll calculate that using the cap M. So risk-free rate plus beta times market risk premium. Risk-free rate was 1.5%, beta was 1.5%, and the market risk premium was 6%. So all told, we have a required return or discount rate of 10.5%. Next, we have the growth rate. And our growth rate is just our ROE, if we want to use this method, times 1 minus our dividend payout ratio. So uh, our dividend payout ratio is 80%, so this makes this 0.2. And ultimately, uh, gives us a growth rate of 0.028, or 2.8%. So when we plug these in, here's what we get. We get an intrinsic share price of $46.73. Okay, how about a little more complicated example? Uh, a stock is currently selling for $15 a share. The firm's EPS in the next year expected to be a dollar, and... Uh, the firm is expected to pay out 50% of its earnings in the form of a dividend. ROE is 12%, and then we have some information on the CAPM components, uh, you know, 2% risk-free rate, risk premium 6%, and beta of 1.3. What is the intrinsic share price of the stock? So notice here I'm trying to throw in a couple additional uh, curveballs, or just really one additional curveball. So here we go. So we know our price, we know our earnings per share next year is a dollar, payout ratio is 50%, and beta is 1.3. ROE, 12%, risk-free rate, 2%, market risk premium, so RM minus RF is 6%. So we'll start off with the required return. 
So just using the cap M, we get a cost of equity or required return of 9.8%. Next, we use our standard ROE times our plowback ratio, or 1 minus the payout ratio, to get, well, 12% times 1 minus 0.5, so you know, 6% is our growth rate. And then finally, we're looking for the intrinsic value. And we know that the next year's uh, earnings per share is a dollar, and we have our payout ratio. So D1 in this case is what we're looking for. And D1, this D1 is basically just our dividend in the past times one plus our growth rate. And uh, we get that by just taking our earnings per share in the next period times our payout ratio, and then we can just use our R minus G. So ultimately, here's what we have. So, you know, a dollar times 50% divided by our cost of equity minus our growth rate, or $13.16. Ultimately, since this is lower than our current share price, we would say that this stock is overvalued. Okay, so let's summarize. We often value financial firms using the replacement cost method. So the reason for this is because this is the method that will allow us to value the assets the firm owns using market value, and then we just subtract out liabilities, divide by number of shares, and that gets us our intrinsic share price. Uh, the DDM, or Gordon Growth Model, is very, very simple, but often an incredibly inaccurate model. You would never want to use this uh, as your main model for valuation. And then always consider how realistic your models or uh, assumptions are when you use the model. Quite frankly, uh, I, I would always use this DDM as a at best, a backup for, for a number of reasons, mostly because you know our growth rate is not going to be the one that you've plugged in there. It's always going to differ a little. And then you've got a bunch of other issues with this model. So uh, with that, I'm going to conclude, and I'll see you on the next video. Thank you.